Hey guys, welcome to another Q&A session on the topic of fleas, ticks and worms. I'm Dr. Mark Lee Asbeck, I work at Green Cross Vets and I'm joined today by Alana from Pet Barn and Dr. Megan from Sweetest. And off camera we've got Chris, the producer, who'll be, you'll be hearing his voice but you won't see him asking lots of your guys' questions. Um, so, yeah. So my name's Alana, I'm from Pet Barn Gosford. Um, I'm a store person there and I'm actually, I'm so happy to be here, but I'm really excited to announce as well, we've actually got a competition running today um, through this, this Facebook Live. Um, we've got three 12 packs of Simparica Trio to give away um, to you guys. So it's really, really easy to enter. All you need to do is pop in the comments um, why your dog is itching to get their paws on a pack of Simparica Trio. So that's a 12 month supply for you. Um, creative, most creative answer wins, so um, feel free to have a go. Um, yeah, very Sounds exciting. Really exciting. <laughs> I can imagine lots of dogs itching to get their paws on that, and yeah. it is a really good product too. So, um, flea sticks and worms, really important topic, and it's important all year round, but especially now as the weather's warming up, it's it's really good reminder to think about um, what what are we doing, and are we doing the best thing that we can to ensure that our furry friends are kept safe? And you know, we get lots of people coming to the clinic asking what's best for my pet and what should I be using? And I guess the answer varies quite a lot, but it, we can tailor that now because we've got so many options and you can head to your, your pet barn store and ask our friendly staff, what, what should I use or your Green Cross stores? And we've got a, a really good tool on the pet barn website as well. That's a flea, tick and worm finder. So you can use that and help you out. But yeah, it's something I like to think about parasites as being internal and external. And when we, when we talk about the internal ones, we've got the intestinal worm. So all the all the things in your belly that are causing upset. And then you've got heartworm, which is its own special little thing, but it's kind of quite deadly as well. And we often forget to think about it, but unfortunately we get reminded when, when it becomes an issue and it's something that's quite difficult and can be expensive to treat. And then we've got the external parasites, which I think we know best because that's all the, the itching and scratching that we get from fleas and, and the ticks that we can see because they're a bit bigger. And depending on where you live as well, paralysis tick is something to be quite concerned about. So I look forward to, to hearing all your questions today. So please make sure that you're sending them through because we, we're going live and we're getting your comments in and I'm, I want to answer all your questions in the time that we have. Um, but yeah, so hopefully we can tackle some important topics and, and go from there. Um, but yeah, so we got, I think, a first question coming through. Sure. So Michael, tell me, why are parasites dangerous? Yes, parasites can be dangerous. I guess if, if you're acquiring a new puppy or a kitten, they're quite prone to getting infectious and parasitic diseases. So we're going to see things like ill thrift or, or difficulty growing, vomiting, diarrhea, and then we've got the scratching from the fleas. And it can, it can be that bad that all the fleas are sucking so much blood that they become anemic or the, the blood count drops quite low. And I kind of alluded before to heartworm, which kind of resides in the heart and the pulmonary vessels. And, and that, can, that can go quite undetected for a while until it becomes a, a bit of a killer later on. Um, and then, as I said as well, we've got paralysis stick, which you could go for a trip somewhere down the coast and it's all good and well until your dog starts showing signs and, or, or your cat even, and, and that can be deadly too. And it's something that can carry a, quite a guarded prognosis and be hard to treat. But the good thing about all these products available is that we can actually prevent a lot of these dangerous diseases from occurring. Thanks, Michael. So tell me, how do you actually get the parasites? Yeah, parasites are everywhere. So if, if you're basically outside or inside, because you know a lot of our pets go in and out and we go in and out, we can carry them in. So basically when we're talking about worms, just think poo. Dogs and cats, unfortunately, they like poo. So if they're walking on it and they lick their paws or if they eat it themselves, they can easily catch a parasite that's been shed by another animal. Um, fleas, they're abundant in the environment. It, they're difficult to see, they scatter away. And uh, interesting to note, the, the fleas that we see on a pet, it's probably only about 5% of the, the whole life cycle of the flea. So the rest of the eggs and the larvae and the pupa, and they're, they're hiding. Um, and they can be in your house and your carpet. And if we forget about it during the winter months, they just come back with a vengeance. So it's really important to stick to year round prevention. So Alana, tell me, what are some tricks you have to check if your pet has fleas? Um, well, visually, it can be quite easy to see, um, especially if you do have a, a shorter haired pet too. You can see what's called flea, flea dirt or flea dust, which is just the droppings of the fleas that you can see on, on your animal's skin. Um, otherwise, you might be able to see the actual flea itself. But, um, but like the doctor said, it's really only 5% what you can see on your pet as to what's actually on, in the environment. So 
it's really just the best idea to keep that um, prevention going all year round to, to stop it getting to a point where it is obviously hard to get rid of and also dangerous for your pet. Because um, if it is really, really bad, you know, your pet can develop dermatitis um, or become anemic as well if it's a long, long infection. Thanks, Alana. So you said um, treating all year round. Michael, can you tell us how often you should be treating your pets? Yeah, absolutely. It, it totally depends on the product that you're using. Um, commonly, products will, will say that you need to use it monthly. And if that's a product you're on, definitely stick to that. Don't let it lapse. Um, because we want to make sure that we're not allowing any breaks in our treatment schedule that allow the parasites to get back in. So we're basically putting up a barrier that we can then forget about. Um, what I like to do if I'm using a monthly product is, because I'm very forgetful, start of every month. Um, other products are three monthly, and so I just say start of every season and you won't forget. But definitely note it down on your calendar, put it in your phone. Um, some products even last six months and other ones even longer than that. So just double check the product that you're using. Use one that fits well within your schedule so that you're less likely to forget and then you should be right. Thanks, Michael. So if my pet hates medicine and won't take it, do you have any tips or tricks for that? Yeah, I mean, if, if we're using an oral medication, a lot of them that have come out lately are, are quite tasty. So I know Symparica and Symparicatria are quite tasty chews and then you've got a few few other ones like Revecto and NextGuard as well. Um, so if you've got a, a dog or a, or a cat, depending on the product that is difficult to peel, you could go for a tasty option. Um, if you're using a tablet, I would say if you can't administer it without them not, not being very happy about it, then you can hide it in a bit of food as well. Um, otherwise, then you've got your options that are topical treatments. So they often involve a small amount of, of a medication applied to the skin part of between the fur, usually in a place that the animal can't lick off. So there's lots of different options that you can use to apply in by different routes that work best for your pet. If um, you do need to administer a tablet as well and you do find it quite difficult, um, I think lots of clinics offer the option as well to bring your pet in and they can administer it for you. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's better if they like to eat it themselves like a treat. <laughs> um, Make it a game. Yeah there's, yeah, there's a few options there. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, guys. So I guess we've talked about frequency. What happens if I forget to do it one month? What should I do in that instance? If you forget, I guess just then ap apply it as soon as you remember. Um, it's really important to, to try and stick to it. If you don't, that's okay. Some products actually give you a little bit of a leeway and, and Megan will talk a bit more about this to make sure that if we're a day or two off, we're still getting really good coverage, but basically <clears throat> treat the next time that you remember and don't give any more. So you don't need to double dose because you've forgotten, you just pick up where you left off. Um, if you are concerned about um, heartworm, for example, where you may have skipped a bigger period of time, just say you've gone away and your pet sitter's forgotten to do it, then have a chat to one of your vets and, and they can advise you if any other testing needs to be done or if we need to be doing anything else in the meantime. Thanks, Michael. Um, one question that's just come in, um, can pets have allergic reactions to the treatments? Absolutely. I guess everything that we're introducing to a pet's skin or to a pet's body, we need to imagine that it's, it's a foreign medication or an object, so they might not necessarily agree with that. And that's the same with us. Like We might take medications that make us feel a bit ill or anything like that. So it's really important to take note of any kind of reaction that occurs. But I'd say that's something we need to consider for every product. And the beauty about having such a variety is that if we notice that, we can then just switch to an alternative and, and make sure that it's a, a safe and healthy experience. One of the good things with Symparica Trio as well is that the active ingredient for um, heartworm prevention is the same as the SR12 Pro Heart Injection. Um, so if you are looking at moving your pet from an injection, then additional medications, so separate worming and flea and tick. If you did want to move your pet over to an all-in-one, um, and they have had that injection before, and you know that that works for your animal, um, it's a bit of reassurance there that this product is going to work for your pet as well. Thanks, Alana. So while we've got Megan here, do you want to maybe talk to us about the, the benefits of Symparica Trio? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, very happy to talk about the benefits of Symparica. I think uh, before, Michael, you touched on um, monthly products and what happens if people are a little bit late. I think one of the nice benefits of Symparica Trio is that we have a label claim for 35 days for fleas and ticks. And really, at the end of the day, I think that's confidence in the product that you're going to have great efficacy for that full month, but also not all months are the same um, length and, and everyone gets a little bit forgetful from time to time because life gets busy. So again, I like your idea of the first of the month. That's what I used to recommend to my clients when I was in practice. Mm. Uh, and you can't go too far wrong, but you've got a little bit of 
um, I a guess, leeway. a little bit of a, that safety feeling uh, mm. that you've, you've got coverage out to 35 days. So that's one, one big benefit. Um, the other one, and I think Alana, you mentioned it before around heartworm, would be, you know, mosquitoes. It's coming into spring and summer, and we know mosquitoes is how heartworms transmitted. So one of the things that uh, Symparica Trio can offer is we did specific testing in heartworm positive dogs. And whilst it's always best practice to go to the vet and get your, your dog tested, if people haven't had heartworm uh, prevention or they've been a bit lax in the winter months and you're not sure, you can definitely start Symparica Trio and know that you're preventing any future uh, problems and then uh, obviously take your dog to the vet and get a, a test would still be advised but it's safe to use in heartworm positive dogs. So I guess there, there are a couple at the moment, Chris. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions. Yeah, sure. So tell me, so we kind of touched on dogs that are a bit fussy with medication. Um, do you want to talk me through what you've done to try and combat that? Yeah, absolutely. I always say that, uh, you know, all products are great, but they're even better if you can get them into the animal <laughs> um, and easily. So Symparica Trio is a, a pork liver flavoured chew. And we based that formulation off other medications and uh, parasite prevention that we've developed in the past. And we know that most dogs will gobble it up. Very scientific <laughs> word there. Uh, that they it, works. it works. It yeah. works. Uh, so yeah, we've got a high percentage of dogs that will just eat it out of the dog's um, owner's hand, which again, makes it more like a treat and not mm. an onerous task every mm. month that you're having to do with your pet. That's great. So Alana, you were kind of talking before about um, the ingredients within the pack. Do you have any questions yeah. for Megan around those ingredients? Um, well, I, I'm a vet nursing student at the moment, so I'm personally just starting to learn a lot more about um, what sort of ingredients do go into these products. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't really have any questions myself, but if anybody else does, feel free to send them through. Like, I thought it was really interesting that it got developed from an injection, which um, like is so popular and lots of people like to get that. Um, it was developed from that into a chew and into an all-in-one like it for me I feel like that makes it a lot easier um, to administer instead of trying to remember yearly as well um, when they're due for heartworm um, but yeah if anybody has any other questions please feel free to send them through. So Megan what's the difference between regular Symparica and Symparica Trio? That's a really great question Chris. Um, so there's a couple of differences the first one relates back to the ingredients I guess Symparica Trio has three ingredients in it, and that gives it not just the ectoparasite coverage, so Dr. Michael was talking about fleas and ticks being really important. Symparica Trio has the addition of heartworm prevention and some gastrointestinal nematode coverage as well. So for owners that are looking for that comprehensive uh, product, I guess that's a go-to. Symparica, on the other hand, is really comprehensive ectoparasite coverage, and it's extremely fast. So. I would say that you know if you have an active problem with fleas or you've forgotten uh, to start tick prevention and you're heading into a tick prone area, potentially for some uh, dogs and, and owners that would be the product that, that you would reach for because of its extensive coverage against ectoparasites and its speed, we call it speed of kill. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that would probably be the, the biggest difference is if the dog's on the heartworm injection at the vet clinic, Symparica would be the best choice to go with that to complement the coverage. Uh, but if they're not on the heartworm injection for any reason, I would say Symparica Trio is a great option that offers that triple protection. Thanks for that. So Michael, um, Gary Briggs has asked us on Facebook, um, is there ticks in Melbourne? Look, there, there probably are ticks in Melbourne. I guess we, we'd be worried about different types of ticks. So I don't think there's as big a problem as the, the paralysis ticks that we have on the, the east coast of Sydney um, and as it gets warmer but then you've got other types of ticks like brown ticks as well those ones they they're more of an irritation externally so while we're not worried about the the deadly paralysis and the and the the breathing issues and the wobbliness and all that kind of thing that you get that requires hospitalization they are kind of like in the flea category I'd say in that they're an external irritant and you know in some areas like in in bushland you might be actually getting a lot on there and so you know we've seen some animals that from various places where you're picking off a lot and that just depends where you are so for that reason I'd say it is really important to to keep coverage and that way you know that if you're going somewhere you're visiting someone on a farm or something like that that you're still quite protected. Great that's fantastic. 
So um, what's the youngest age from which I can give my dog some paracotrio? That's probably a good one for you, Megan. Yeah, I could answer that one. Uh, we obviously wanted a product that could be used in a wide variety of dogs. And so we've done studies to show it's safe to use in dogs from eight weeks of age and also dogs that are really light. Uh, so dogs uh, eight weeks of age, but also 1.25 kilograms. I think the benefit there is that those tiny little dogs as they're growing, they don't miss out on having great protection um, straight off the bat. So yeah, 1.25 kilos in eight weeks of age is the start for some paracotria. That's great. And I guess if I wasn't sure on the exact product for my pet, um, what, what could I do to find the right one for my dog? Yeah, look, I, I would say, you know, speak to the vet or speak to the, the pet store staff. They're all, all highly trained and Again, I think it comes back to the beginning. There's a lot of resources on, on your websites and a lot of knowledge. So it's really finding what's the best fit for that individual. Um, that would be my opinion um, from when I was in clinical practice and I've carried that through to working uh, for one of the pharmaceutical companies. And we have all sorts of resources in store as well. We've got pamphlets that we can give you um, if you need it. And all of our staff are um, you're quite highly trained on the products as well. Um, so yeah, always, always welcome to pop in store and have a chat with us. Great. So another question for you, Michael. Um, we've spoken about there being ticks in Melbourne, um, but is there a difference between bush ticks and beach ticks? And yeah, I guess, as I said before, the main thing, so there's heaps of types of ticks. They've all got different names. They look a little bit different. Um, but basically, if you're closer to the water or the coast, you're a little bit more worried about the paralysis ticks, and they're the ones that are quite deadly. And then as you go kind of in towards drier land, then you're worried about the ones that are, are the external irritants. So um, I work down in Wollongong as well, and so that's quite coastal. Uh, we, we definitely worry about paralysis tick, and we used to see a, a whole lot more cases, um, and they are quite devastating. Some of them will need to be on a ventilator, and, and that can be quite cost prohibitive, and, and it's, it's really concerning when they do get to that point because the chances of getting them back are, are lower. Um, but since we've seen good tick prevention come out, something that the dogs enjoy taking and something that is easy to give, we've noticed a big decrease in those cases. And so it, it's been amazing from a vet's perspective. So Carla asks, I guess, if her pet spends a lot of time indoors and only goes outside for a couple of doors, um, what's the advice there? Yeah, so in those cases, I, I guess we can say that, that risk might be a bit lower, but we know that as people that go in and out frequently, we are often a source or a, a fomite is the word that we like to use where we can actually bring infectious material in. Um, so that can be either directly on our skin, on our clothes or in our shoes. Um, we often forget about the shoes, but we, we're walking in soil and, and there's tons of life in that soil that can be flea, eggs, worm eggs and all those kinds of things. So we can't completely eliminate the risk because often the things we're, we're dealing with are, are quite microscopic. So to, to make sure that we're getting the best coverage is to do that internally or externally on the animal, depending on the product that you're using and feeling comfort that even if they're exposed to it by what we bring in or their brief encounters outdoors, that, that those parasites will be killed quickly. I'll, I'll just add to that and say mm. the other thing is with heartworm, because it's transmitted differently. Absolutely. It's transmitted by mosquito. I, I always say there's no such thing as an outdoor only mosquito. That's right. They come and find me indoors. We definitely get mosquitoes <laughs> indoors, absolutely. So, and, yeah. and on that, we, I, I work pr primarily in Campbelltown and I never thought that would be a heartworm area. I always think, all right, we're, we're in the tropics, mm. but we've diagnosed cases there. And so it, it means it is about, and it only takes one infection and, and one pet, and we don't want that to be yours. So basically the message is keep protected all the time. If there is anyone just joining our Facebook Live as well, we do have a competition running at the moment. So we've graciously been gifted uh, three 12 month supply from uh, the team at Zoetis of Symparica Trio. Um, just let us know in the comments why your dog's itching to get their paws on a 12 month supply. Um, the most creative answers will win. So just make sure you pop your answers, um, all your entries down, down below. Thanks, Alana. Thanks for that reminder. Um, so, Michael, um, you touched on kind of things being in the soil, etc. Uh, we've had a question come in from Hon, um, has asked whether can flea eggs survive in the soil even if there's no pet around for years, um, and could that infect my new pet? Absolutely. It, they, they can definitely survive without a pet being around. I guess the length of time depends on a number of things, and it, it's it's got to do with temperature, vibrations in the area humidity, a whole number of things. So generally speaking, 
when it's warmer, they're out and about and they can go dormant when an area has been undisturbed or it's a bit cooler. And that's why a lot of people forget about treatment during the, the colder months because we're not seeing it as prominently. Um, but if we're not treating actively in that time, then that's where they can go undetected and, and they just jump right in if you're not protected. So short answer, yes. Great. So Alana, you touched on this before. I guess when you were saying that you install, you have tools to help people find the right um, product for them. Um, we've had a question come in which is along the vein from Adrian Gadaro. He's asked, how can I find the best protection for my pet online? Is there some kind of program I can use or is um, anything like that that I can use to, sort of, to find a suitable product for my dog? That I'm not 100% sure about. Um, if there's a specific program, we do have our Pet Barn website, um, which details a lot of the products that we stock. So you're welcome to jump onto that website and have a good browse, um, see what suits sort of your lifestyle more, like topical versus chews. Um, there's quite a lot on that website. But other than that, if there's any sort of specific program, like questionnaire or something externally, um, I'm not too sure. Um, but they, we certainly have the resources online. And on the Green Cross website as well, there's um, lots of information there too. So we do have the flea tick and worm um, finder online, um, but uh, yeah, I guess there as you, you said. <laughs> <laughs> so my cat has been overgrooming the base of her tail. Um, this question is coming in from Anna. Um, so my cat's been overgrooming the base of her, her tail. She's losing a lot of fur in those spots, and they're quite worried. Um, they can't see any signs of fleas. Should we still try flea treatment? Absolutely. Um, so cats, in particular, can be tried quite difficult to identify fleas on them. Um, compared to dogs, they take pride in themselves, they groom themselves quite a lot. Um, and so often we see even less than the 5% of the population on a cat. Um, so I've spent lots of time trying to convince my clients that, that there are fleas and I'll be in the consult room coming through the coat. Occasionally you'll see a live flea. As Lana said before, um, you, you can look for flea dirt and it, when you look at it, it, it looks like little specks of dirt, but a little trick that we use is, is getting a flea comb, coming through the coat and then getting that dirt and putting it on a bit of a moistened white paper towel. And then when that dissolves, if, if that's got a bit of a red tinge, it's likely to be flea dirt because it's the digested blood. Um, so that can be a bit of a clue, but even if we don't see that and we're, we've got an itchy cat, one of the easiest things to rule out is a flea infestation or a flea bite hypersensitivity. And to do that as a diagnostic test is to treat, treat for a period of time, break the cycle. And then once we've eliminated that, then we go into other things like, is it an anxiety disorder? Is it an allergy of another type? So um, it's a process of elimination. Skin disease can be quite a, a tricky one to deal with, but absolutely definitely need to use fleet prevention. So while we're on the topic of like finding out, you know, how to figure out if your dog has a certain um, condition, how do you know if your dog has a heartworm? This question's coming from Ellie. Yeah, so heartworm, it, it can be absolutely silent. So the, the case that I referred to earlier that we diagnosed at my clinic, it actually came in for a completely different presentation. It was vomiting. Um, and that's not something we often think about when we think of heartworm because we, Usually when we think of heartworm, we think of heart-related things or respiratory signs. Um, so basically, the best way to find out is to do a blood test. Um, and it's a quick in-clinic test that we can run. And we often do that, as Megan said, before we start on, on treatments as well. Um, and what that does is basically look for a, a part of, of the worm that's producing the, the little worms in there. Um, so it does take about six months for that female egg to produce that antigen is what we call it. Um, a part of their reproductive tract. So it, it's a quick test, it's quite accurate. And other things we can do is look for little microfilaria in the, in the blood. So that involves taking a blood sample, looking at a blood smear and looking for little microscopic parasites there. So often it goes silent clinically, which means externally we have no idea until we do those lab tests. Thank you. So Leah's come in with a question. Um, it's quite a long one. She says they visit their parents' farm. And unfortunately, when they go th to the farm, it is riddled with fleas and ticks. She says her fur babies are covered in them as soon as they get out of the car. Um, they're already using a chew tablet um, and it's supposed to cover all. How can she prevent this from happening by bringing them back in their car um, and back to home? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I guess it, it is good that some products we know work really fast. And so Symparica is one of them and Symparica Trio. So those ones, uh, is it about eight hours or four hours? It takes starts work? killing in four hours. Yeah. Um, and our studies have shown 100% kill in eight hours. So it does work really quickly, but they're not repellents. And I think that's one of the hard things is, you know, you've got the product on board to 
help kill those adult fleas when they jump on. Um, but they're really hard. They're, they've evolved for years to, yeah. <laughs> to torment Absolutely. us and our pets, I think. Um, they, they can be hard to, to manage, but yes. Yeah, so they do work pretty quickly. There are other products that we could consider that, that work quick as well, um, but they don't persist in the, in the system for as long as Simparacuda does. So we could always have a chat about maybe using a combination of products in, in those specific situations or, or looking at repellents as well. Yeah. Um, but it's very case by case, and, and so we, we'd have to make sure that the products we're using can go together well. Um, and then it's, it's also about kind of decontaminating before they come in. Um, and, if, and you want to make sure that they're, they're treated before you get back home so you're not having that problem at home as well. So. Thank you, Michael. So, um, Dr. Megan, I have a question in from Glenda. Um, how do I transition from one brand to another? Um, how should this transition occur? Is it as simple as beginning the new brand when the usual dose is done or...? Glenda, a question from Glenda? Yeah. Glenda, thank you for your question. It's a really good one. It does depend slightly on what products you've been on, but typically the, the easiest way that I would say to transition from one to the other is, you know, if you're using a monthly product, then when the dog's next due or the cat, uh, at that point is when you would make, make the change. Um, so I would just be aware of the duration of time that each product is working for and make the switch at the end of that period. I think that's the, the safest way to do it. Of course, if you had any questions, I'm, I'm sure the staff at, at the clinics or, or the store would be happy to to help out with individualised, um, you know, examples and, and suggestions for your, your particular pet. Thanks, Megan. So we've had a question come in from Jennifer Burke. Um, she has asked, is it OK to go about six weeks if your cat's only indoors? So theoretically, because of the duration of, of each product, it does allow a window to get reinfected with another parasite. So I would say if we wanted to make sure that we're not allowing any opportunity for the fleas to get back in, it's really important to stick to the four weeks because as the product kind of wanes toward the end, if we're allowing a two week window, then we're gonna get reinfected. So although indoors we, we can suspect that hopefully they're becoming less in contact with fleas, um, it's still best practice to stick to the label recommendation and, and in that case, it would be every four weeks. Great. So we've had a question coming from Courtney. Um, she's saying that she's about to start using this product for her three-month-old Kelpie. Um, what are the side effects? Yeah, th thanks for your question. And it's really great that you're uh, going to start your, your young dog on Simparica Trio. I would say with a lot of the oral um, medications or preventatives and Simparica Trios included in that, probably the most common side effects that we, we can see, and when I say most common, they, they don't happen that frequently, would be um, vomiting or, or diarrhea, like gastrointestinal up, upset. So uh, we, we don't see a lot, uh, but they would be something to, to look out for and just be mindful if you're giving it for the first time, make sure they've taken uh, the chew and, and swallowed it so that the prote protection is on board, uh, you know, that they haven't done a, a sneaky <laughs> pretend to take it and, and chuck it out. But it's unlikely to happen with Simparica Trio, I would say. Great, so um, another question we've had come in, um, probably a good one for you, Michael. Um, can dogs be born with worms? Yeah, they absolutely can be. And depending on the type of worm, they have different routes of transmission. And so this brings us back to kind of keeping our animals protected all the time. And depending on the product, some of them are safe to use in pregnant animals and some are not. And it's just because studies haven't done, haven't been done on them yet. But some routes that can cause a puppy to be infected by the time they're born, are through the placenta and then shortly afterwards they can also get infected through the milk and that happens with, with some in particular. So that's why it's really important to start treating quite early. Um, so often we start with some particular products from two weeks old just to try and get in there and also treating the, the mum dog while she's pregnant and lactating and then once we get to that kind of eight week mark where we're bigger then we start with other products like Simparica Trio to get the flea tick and everything on board but absolutely for, for the intestinal worms they can be. Great. So this is an interesting question. Um, I know we're talking mainly about cats and dogs uh, but what about mite, lice and worm treatments for birds? Interesting. I don't see many birds, but definitely they can be afflicted with mites and lice. Um, often, my experience at least has been that people treat as they come, but have you guys had much bird experience? Uh, I, I didn't see a whole lot of birds uh, from the practices that I worked at. I actually worked at a cat-only practice for a few years too, so there weren't any birds there. <laughs> but at, at the other clinics that I worked at, I didn't see a whole lot of birds. I think 
part of the issue when you get to species outside dogs and, and cats uh, and rabbits is a lot of products are not labelled for use in those species. And so that's where it would be having a discussion with your veterinarian as to the choice uh, to, to treat them. But often there's not a specific uh, product that's been registered and labelled uh, for, those, for those species. And I guess one example of that, which isn't bird related, but we've had a chat before about um, using revolution on rabbits, for example. So that, that would be considered off-label, but it's something that... We actually have it on label now for, for rabbits. There you go. So since then. <laughs> um, but basically an off-label recommendation is something that a vet may may recommend to you based on enough data, enough science to, to know that it is quite safe, but it's not yet registered on the label. So that's a discussion that should be done with the vet as well. If your bird, um, so we do stock poultry and um, aviary bird wormers and um, might uh, treatment as well. It's not so much a prevention, but we do stock treatments in store at Pet Barn um, in our bird and poultry sections. Um, so if you do pop in store, um, yeah, if you talk to us about it, like sort of let us know what your bird's sort of looking like or um, even bring in photos as well. There's usually someone in store who can point you in the right direction for it. Um, again, not a preventative, um, but I don't think that there are many preventatives for birds, but we do stock um, products which will treat what they have but yeah best course of action if um if we're not sure we'll refer you to a vet <laughs> we won't give you advice that's um yeah that we're not confident with thanks alana so this might be a good question for you michael um is there an injection for fleas ticks and worms there's no injection that i'm aware of for fleas ticks and worms often the the injection that a lot of people hear about um, is the the pro heart injection that's for heartworm purely um, so usually we're when I, when I try to decide on the best protocol for a particular patient, I say, what do you want to do with a heartworm first? Because we, we choose either the yearly injection or do we want to do a monthly product? And then I just work backwards from there. And so it's usually about picking that first and then deciding how often can I or do I want to treat the, the fleas, ticks and worms? And then we build it around that way. Um, but yeah, no, no one miracle injection at the moment, but stay tuned maybe one day. <laughs> That's great. So, um, <coughs> One quick question, um, can I get parasites from my pet if they have them? Yes, absolutely. Um, and again, it's something we, we tend to forget about because we we're definitely have our pet's best interests at heart. Um, it's something that I think about a bit in practice because dealing with cats and dogs every day, but something that people should be aware of at home as well. Um, everyone, but especially if you've got kids, um, elderly people, or people who are immune compromised, so their immune systems aren't as strong. Um, but the, the common worms that we're talking about and that we treat with these products are worms that can affect us as well. Um, so roundworm, hookworm, flea bites, things like that. And I guess the, the scary thing is because those worms aren't actually meant to be in us, their, their pathway through us as people is a bit different and that can cause issues. So an intestinal worm in a cat and dog could actually end up migrating to your eye as a person or through your skin if you're walking barefoot in a, in a place that's got a hookworm infection. So it's, it's not good. Um, it, it's not something you even want to risk. So um, in terms of public health, uh, we call them zoonoses. So any infection or disease that can be transmitted from animal to human, it's really important that we, we keep our environment as clean as we can. Thanks, Michael. So um, we've got time for a few more questions. Um, not sure who's going to take this one, but one of my fur babies is constantly rubbing and dragging her butt across any surface she can get her butt on. What is this from and why does she do it? Be a number of things, I think. Um, so a, a big one to, to rule out is worms um, because some worms may become apparent around the rear. Tapeworm is an example there, but um, in my experience, often it, it can be an anal gland issue as well. So it's really important to get a physical exam performed, ensure there's no physical problems around that area. And that's an examination that a, a vet can do. And then often if we don't find anything there, then we'll pursue some testing to ensure that there's no parasite burdens. But do you guys have anything to... No, I'd say they're the, the two most common things that you'd be wanting to rule out in the first instance. Yeah. Have a look at, yeah. yeah. So our final question comes in, um, and it's actually for you, Dr. Megan. So um, it's quite simple. How effective is Simparica Trio? Yeah, great question. Thank you for your question. Uh, it's, it's highly effective. We've done a whole bunch of studies. Uh, and I, I guess one of the things I'm really proud of, having worked at Zoetis, is it's an, a research and development company. So we spend a lot of time uh, and effort, our scientists do, not myself, 
really making sure that they're, they're highly efficacious products before we, they get out to market. So I'd be really confident with the efficacy, flea and tick efficacy as we go into summer. Uh, it's got 100% efficacy in the prevention of heartworm disease and again, really high efficacy against the gastrointestinal nematodes. So I hope that answers the question. It does. So with that said, that's actually all the time we have for questions here. Um, so thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Um, it's been really good to talk about it. If there have been questions that have been answered, our, our team will get onto it. But um, thank you so much for your participation. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye.